brings me to one that I wrote some years ago. Remember Standing Rock? I, I don't know if you remember the incident of, um, you know, the, during the resistance of the water defenders, they were like on a, on a bridge and um, uh, the police uh, threw a grenade and, uh, you know, a, a, I think like an 18 year old girl who was like a supporter and was handing out bottles of water. She got her um, uh, arm almost turn off so at the time when they I were protesting out, laying down that oil gas pipeline yeah. from canada right. to the new orleans yeah yeah and it was like the water protectors you know the the indigenous people it's called the in praise of wounded water bearers meeting prayers with grenades on a north dakota bridge stretched over water rumbled by a greedy oil snake feasting on a 21-year-old girl's arm. And now the flesh, the stunned veins, the exuberant nerves that once held bottles of water to, a, to quench a thirst that knows no end can no longer bridge thought and action. Downstream they float, buoyed by the molecules of life, singing them a song of the spirit, flowing as they have since the first day of creation. Don't go seeking bombs in Gilead, the sharp knoll of wars past and present, jabbing and scarring this decrepit order out of its slumber as the earth deploys her children of the seventh generation to regain her breath and song. And uh, talking about these kids of the wow. seventh generation, I, I work with a lot of younger poets and one of them is named Lucia Cupertino. She's, um, She's, uh, she was born in Southern Italy, but she's been doing a lot of work in uh, Latin America. She's an anthropologist and a poet as well. And she writes uh, both in Italian and in uh, Spanish. And uh, she, a lot of the things she writes about are um, based like on uh, indigenous thinking and uh, the different, a different relation to the, you know, to the non-human non uh, beings. And this one she dedicates to the to a river in uh, Colombia. It's called the the Cauca River, um, which is one of the most polluted uh, rivers of um, you know of Latin America because of uh, gold uh, mining that happens there. And uh, it's one of the areas where um, the indigenous indigenous pop, uh, population has been resisting and sometimes ends up you know floating up dead in the river. And uh, this is an Italian, so I'll read an Italian. Okay, and please give us her name again, please. Lucia. Lucia, Lucia L L U C I A Cupertino. C -U Cupertino. C E R T I N O. Oh, good. Fiume Cauca. Io t'ho visto dall'alto di un ponte. Fiume Cauca, che solchi questa terra dorata. Ma fu in un sogno d'uccello che vidi i corpi gonfi a pelo d'acqua, gli avvoltoi sbrogliarne le viscere, le gonne logore di tanto oblio. Quando la verità fa nido sulla mia bocca, irrompono zattere e un intero popolo le abita. Sono gli occhi dei senza giustizia ad affacciarsi. I tuoi stessi occhi, fiume cauca, bruciano ancora. Ok, grazie, grazie. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, if you want to see her work, uh, she's very, a very powerful poet. She's young, but I think she will be doing a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, good work in the next years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you, you have just rendered the first poem in Italian. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah. In, our, so other in our, yeah. our brief history is Angora Poets. Yeah, uh, you've just rendered our first poem in Italian. And, oh, uh, good, good. Well, it was, it was very nice meeting you all, and thank you for um, you know, for having me. Yeah, and evening. we invite you back. Um, we invite yeah. you back. You have. I want to let people know that uh, uh, Pina is pressed for time right now, but uh, I've been following her for quite some time, and like others in this square, in this group, she has an incredible, incredibly interesting story that involves herself and other people. So uh, I invite you back and uh, we'll hear more from you in the future, Pina. Yeah, and I, I would love hearing everybody else's poems, but unfortunately tonight I had that set up, but in the next meetings, I would really love to. 
and uh, you can if you're on Facebook you can find me you know and um, uh, just you know try to friend me and I'll um, so I, I get to see your work as well because I would really love to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so okay. So yeah. Thanks for your poems. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, andiamo, andiamo. Okay, arrivederci. Ciao, au revoir. Ciao, bella. Ciao, Ciao. Ciao. arrivederci. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Okay. So. Are you, uh, are you recording? So, to, are you recording, Mo? Yes, I am, Bill. Good. And this time I'm going to get it right. I'm going to go back to uh, uh, moving this thing back onto YouTube. Now we have somebody else that hasn't been on for a while, and her name, this is Isabel. And uh, I would like to invite Isabel to present for us now. Welcome okay. back, Isabel. So on the conversation, I said uh, that tonight we are the Magnificent Sevens <laughs> against capitalism, its idiocracy, and its pornocracy. They're shaking in their boots, Isabel. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jack Cooper and uh, his friend uh, Roxanne Hoffman make me work. work. So, it's an orange poem that I wrote uh, thanks to them. He was driving on the black road through oranges fields in the north of Portugal. He just escaped from the jail of his mind, where he had been con confined for months, years perhaps. <clears throat> I don't have a good voice. He remembers the oranges his lover brought him on Sundays when they met. He had crammed those oranges on the table of the kitchen. He was playing with them, rolling them under the paws of his black cat, or throwing them in the garden as balls to his orange dog to bring them back against caresses. He would juggle with them, or hurl them against the partition of glass that stood between his lover and him. And then he let them out until he could collect the dust of their skin, mix it with oil and smudge it on his drawings or sm or, and smudge his drawings with it. I don't know which is the right English. Orange is the new black. He left town for the south of France, Spain and now Portugal. The sun was softer and softer and played amazing flashes on the fruits of the orange trees. Plenty of them felt on the grass, under the trees and rot. No one seemed to care. No one came to pick them. The whole area seemed deserted, silence, sick, as the flight of the blackbirds invaded ground and skies. He picked some oranges, peeled them, squeezed them. The juice flew through his throat like the juice of life, like the juice of freedom, the juice of traveling far away from all that rot. Their juice was sweet and bitter, like the new dreams that bounced inside his chest, opened their wings and knocked down his pale and cold heart, down on the knees of hope. He would keep driving south, forever south, and the road in front of him opened her arms, opened a new space, in the sky, and his chest filled with air and strength. His lungs opened wide to a new vivid breath. His body blew up like an orange balloon and he swept south 
to the end of Africa, to the, to the Cape of Good Hope, to the old legions of sailors and the ancient heroes. There he would embark on a boat with orange sails and her further south to the very south, to the very heart of the South Pole. Slowly on a dreamy trip through the mist of the Milky Way, the whiteness of ice and the darkness of night, the softness of the waters and the harshness of the ground. The sky is red and orange, the sunset on Sunset Boulevard. Hollywood sign glitters on the hills of fame and shame. He turns on Orange County and starts running through the night of LA, through the night that gets down on the Western world. And the Western world, the obscurity of the lost desires, swangle their reasons and blur their visions. Thank you. Ding, thank you. And did that appear in, in the, uh, the the blog, the-, the uh... It will, it will. Oh, it, it will. Yeah. Uh, okay, so certain colors are going to repeat themselves uh, in her no, blog? No, it's still orange. Well, I am the only one to do that. <laughs> To say yellow, 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 orange, orange, orange. Yeah, no, it's it's still orange. Oh, okay. All right. Good enough. Well, congratulations on the poem and on the fact that it's going to be uh, on the. Uh, you call the blog the uh, Poets Wear Product blog? No, the Rainbow Project. Yeah, that's right, the Rainbow Project. Cool enough. It's a good project, actually. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Do you have another poem for us, uh, Isabel? Yes, a small, a little one I wrote. Uh, what, alpha feet today, and alpha feet uh, a month ago. On the highway for glory, the trees nag at me and swing their shades. It's half in French. Les lampadaires s'éteignent. Car crashes sweet my life and slow the rhythm of my running flight, the rhythm of my song. Dead bodies and dead feelings. Jonch l'alphat, l'alsfat, qui file en brillant sous la pluie, qui tombe sous la grêle du désespoir et de la honte. Failing and resurrection and resurrection as the phoenix from Ashij, Ashij. Le feu de mon esprit brille et s'éteint, étincelle crépitante dans la nuit, on the highway to death. She lost control again, mental crisis, attack of the enemy, inside, outside. She recovered her strength, lucidity, from the basement of the building built on the soil of the minds of the crowd. The whole of the crows on the darkest night, on the darkest days, Slumber awake, surrounded by creeps. To the extension of my own kind, humanity and inhumanity, at the crossroad, enigma of the Sphinx. The bridge over the sticks where all the dead souls crumble and make me stumble. Just to put words on it, assholes, how I sing. There, no.
At the end of the bridge, between the sea and the sky, at the end of the time, at the end of the night, I got lost in the tunnel of memory. I followed the shadows of my dream. Above my head, the birds need a marvelous symphony. That's it. Okay, all right. Thank you. Now, let me admit another poet on the screen again. Benedicta is back. Uh, and um, so that was your second poem. That was one poem. Was that right, Isabel? The second one? It was yeah, what, two poems together. Okay, I was kind of wondering. Yeah, and it was on, uh, uh, two months ago. Uh -huh. First, it was today. All right, very good. Well, thank you. And uh, for those of you who will hear this broadcast later, uh, it's clearly uh, uh, it's clearly warranted that we give her an extra thank you for writing all that in her second language. Right. Second language, second language. Wonderful, Isabel. Okay. All right. Okay. So, Benedicta, can you hear us? Oh, there you are. Uh, are you good with your audio? We can't hear Benedicta. Yeah. Yeah. I want to get to it. Not yet. And now you're muted, Benedicta. Now it's showing muted. Um, okay. Oh, we lost you again. It's it's okay now. Can you hear me? Yeah, but I can hear background as well. I can hear more than just you. So. Oh, okay. I'm home now. So. Yeah, but we need you to. I don't know what that other background is, but we're interested in hearing you. Is it is it fine now? Is it better? Is my sound okay? Yes, it is. Yes, it okay. is. Okay, good. Welcome back on board. I'm glad you got home. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so hang on there, and we'll be calling you up soon. But for the moment, okay, uh, okay thank you. For the moment now, let, let's switch to the judge and, uh, and bring on uh, Bill Strangmeyer to read for us. Bill? You're muted, Bill. Okay, here we go. Okay, this is called transactional. Social animals given to belonging, whatever fad they give you is enough. A little bit of difference, a little bit of laughter. Belonging's not for you, I mean you cannot have it. That feeling's all you get, all you deserve. So easy to transform the worldwide herd, if you have the time. Just a couple generations and they're traitors. Too dumb to see it coming. Don't even see the titles. It's written into jokes and in the movies. And because the villain always loses there, they'll never think, they'll think it never comes to pass. But it's coming on to stay, think not. The team spirit always gets them. The fall guy's always pulling in the fists and throwing rocks. This year, the old hetero white male. There you go. Age, orientation, race, sex, the bigots home run. Always a one. And well, they play the game. They'll bring back black folk, gays, and Jews. But it's only fair for all to hate the each. And pleasure too must now be hated. Sex is off the books of righteous prophets. Standard mammalian sex, at least. But it's only fair, right? Payback's a bitch, but who gets the bill? Not the bosses, the nobles, the kings, the rich. Not the mandarins or brahmins pissing down. Who wrote the law books? for y'all good folks to follow. And who killed dissent? Everyone loves a pylon just to show them. How can you stop the rain from falling down? On them, because they're different. The bastards, the different. Different from what? From us, we hope. I despair of mankind. Oh, sorry, wrong term. Like every evil down through time, it's just damn silly as a cause. What? Well, Whatever hatred you espouse, whatever innocence you would despoil, deny, the tortured twisters of the language rule. The Romans thought that Latin showed deceit. 
We are not astute like that. Because we love crooks, because we have fake heroes, because we're team players, company men or women. Solidarity. Maggie Thatcher, Sarah Palin, Hillary Clinton, Kamala Harris. Not hard to find men they're better than or worse, but who cares? Politics always attracts the vilest from Caesar till today. And the sheep follow along, give them a bright shiny light, give them a gas bag or a silly cause. They'll go for it as long as there's rage or even a way to put down their friends, a way to turn jealousy into an enmity, a way to beat losers. You're a loser if you bite. The humans love their spite. The imp called spite lives in our souls. To follow its voice is to court cowardice. Speak kind and be honest if you would be a warrior. All but the psychopaths have a conscience and conscience doth. Family too, that's how they'll hold you. They are brutes and their supporters are clueless brutes and mob cowards. They come in all colors and sexes. The proof that there is no God is this. There are a million in every country. What an odious invention, countries. Less in the small ones, more in the big. Who should not live? Who should die? Who are they? The psychopaths, most politicians, talentless billionaires, street gangs, many cops, serial criminals, mafias, hackers, bullies, street thieves, pricks, bitches, snots. No, wait, I'm getting too personal now. But really, aren't there many who should not be alive? Just life, I guess. Ooh, happy fucking holidays. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you got a point about intersectionality now beginning to groups turning on each other. That is true. It, it set it out so well, and then it began uh, who can be holier than thou and pointing out um, uh, pointing out who they consider violators and heretics. You're right about that. Yeah. There's even a division now in the uh, transgender movement, one, one side fighting the other. And uh, while all that's going on, uh, it's not affecting too much the national, the urgency of national needs because so many groups are fighting against each other. Oh, happy holidays, Billy. You have another one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, call this Let the Shadow Shine. There is a light, there is a light. It calls while it gives, it calls us up. Some call it this, some call it that. It is a call to keep going on. The weight of the dark is much, but lightness is the counterweight. A pool of light from the window pane is what pulls us from the shadow well. In dreams we escape from the twofold sphere and the keys and the codes and the riddles there. But the door is really right now, right here. I hope to dream, I hope for delight, I hope that the world will soon glow. I hope that hope is something real and not just a slogan for thieves and for fools. But until it's been proved not a whimsical wraith, I still seek a light through the shade of the day. Nice, nice. Against the odds, we stay in the game. <laughs> yes, okay. So, Bill, would you give us uh, Three's a Charm? Yeah. This is called Shortages. Was it too selfish? Was I too happy? Unsure? Too sure? What you took was not what I thought would ha you would have. You took some arrogance with you away, because I now don't know what to think or say. And you move about withheld and silent in your loveless, loving, family-friendly world. But was it love? Your motto now, your raison d'être loin. Paper airplanes fly overhead, missing their aim. The call of whimsy goes unheard, no sound through the fluid air. And still there is an echo, the soft whisper of a clue. The fluttered wing of a butterfly ends no worlds down the line. That's it. That's it. That's a lot. All right. Very good, Bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. All right. Now, I want to ask you all to uh, chat in your compliments or whatever between poems, because if you're reading, 
I would not like to be distracted on screen. You know, I would like to hear you. So please enter your chats, your compliments, or whatever between poems, if that would be okay, so that we might give full attention to the poet who's rendering in the moment. Okay, that'd be nice. You're all too good to be diverted from. Okay, okay. K, K. <laughs> all right, so, okay. Are you ready for us, Benedicta? Yes, I am. Oh. Okay. Can I We're ready for you. you. Sure. Um, I'll hit the button. There it is. Okay. They said only the host can share in this meeting. Um, that's a good question. I just hit share screen. I'm sure it's not picking. They said only the host can share in this meeting. Uh, it might be the case, Benedicta. I have to get more up on on um, doing you command have instructions. To enable it for attendees to be able to share their screen. Yeah, well, I did. You see, Benedicta, I have one icon in front okay. of me that says share screen, and I just uh, put it on. I think uh, I I think someone might correct me that the person reading has to do that themselves as well. I can enable the share screen, and then I think you have to command it on your end. Yes, when I command it on my end, it, it's giving me a notification that only the host can share in this meeting. Then you'd have uh, to click on OK. Well, so I'm sure uh, you, before you started the recording, you didn't enable it. That's why it's not giving uh, the, the chance. That's where well, the problem I'm, is from. But well, fine. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Okay. You realize you have half a shot in Ready when you are, Benedicta. Oh dear. She wants to you... share her screen. Is that is that what's going on? Now we've lost now we've lost her. She's gone. Come back. <laughs> We're a first generation learning how to manipulate and command the Zoom screen. We need someone about 11 years old to straighten this out. Exactly. <laughs> they wouldn't be able to explain it to how we could do it, but they could do it for us. We have shared screen before, particularly with El Habib from Morocco, who uh, shared okay, through all I'm three. Back. Okay, you're back, and we're listening. <laughs> I thought I'd, I'd lost touch. Okay, so today, my first is captioned episodic movement of Ghana. I read, Ghana, an epic African country of most neighboring borders. It holds the peaceful assets of pride and its united solidarity amongst member states. When it comes to natural resources, a cannon flare which can be outwitted because of its tenacity to stay in a land of pureness and undeniable prospects, Ghana, my homeland, is truly blessed and enriched with devoted and selfless patriots and hardworking citizens who seek the very best of our nation. Long live Ghana. That's the first one. Okay. Long live Ghana. Go with that. Go with that. Long live Ghana. And a, a second piece for us, Benedicta. Okay, so the second one will be a monoko. And it says, defenseless and concealed, an iteration of oblivion. Okay. That's my monoko for the second part. 
And as we do with monocos and haikus, would you please read that again for us? And slowly, please. Defenseless and concealed, an iteration of oblivion. Mm -hmm. Defenseless and confused in ice. No, I said defenseless and concealed. Concealed, that is the word. Concealed. Right, concealed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and defenseless I and concealed, an iteration of oblivion. Okay. That's okay. Monoko. Okay. Very it's good. It's a one-liner. Yeah, that's a dark Monoko in isolation like that, yes. Okay, can we hear Three's a Charm, please? So the third one will be a haiku. Hold on a second. Cribs and cracks, seeping flares, the benchmarks of the past. That's about it. Okay. Uh, let's hear it again. It's a haiku. Cribs and cracks, seeping flares, the benchmarks of the past. Okay. And what are these benchmarks in the past? It entails a lot. Yes, it does. I'm sure it does. And haikus <laughs> do. No, I know, I know that. I just wondered if you wanted to give us uh, examples of those creeks and cracks. Hmm? It could be in a stepwise fashion, okay. which is loaded with a lot to unravel. Yeah, okay. That's true. You know, because people study haikus. There are people actually make a, a very serious study of haiku to penetrate the depth of its of its meanings in, in those those three lines. So that's why Mostly I see I attach an image to it. Mm -hmm. So that's what is able to bring out what I mean by it. If I was okay. able to share the screen, I would have shown you the image that I attached to it. Okay. That would be much better and it portrays what you want to bring out of what you're saying. Okay. Well, our loss. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm sure it's because of the recording. Yes. Well, um, okay, because you, you, you remind me of something in uh, terms of Japanese art and uh, somewhat in Chinese art. Well, do you know the paint, the traditional way to paint? in Japan and mm -hmm. China is to show a small part of the, let's call it a square, okay, the portraits in a square. A small part of it is consumed with a house surrounded by small vegetation. And then the rest of the image goes into subtle, subtle expansion. Okay, so as opposed yeah. to Western style where, where objects are, are the focus. So um, mm -hmm. in China and in Japan, they'll do that. They'll show a small, a small house, uh, usually on the lower right side of the painting, which is how the language moves right to the left. And then the, the majority of, of the, um, the canvas, if you will, or the rice paper, is just mm -hmm. simply a vague suggestion of sky and clouds. And in their understanding, uh, that is the way to expand on the complexity of the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So you're you're tapping on that tradition. On that tradition. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now tell me what is that background I'm hearing now? That was for my TV. <laughs> well, you, we want to hear you, not your TV. So next time you got to turn off that TV so we can only hear you, okay? That is trying to listen to the news too. <laughs> yeah, well, you can multitask on your time, but the priority of this, <laughs> this Zoom is to hear you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Benedicta. Okay. You're welcome. 
Okay. So now let, let, let's uh, move on here. Well, David Wilson, you came on early tonight. I did. You did. And so yeah. um, let's invite you on to read. Thank you very much. Um, I know that the uh, tradition here in Angora Poets is three poems in the first round. I'm just going to read one piece that's a little bit longer today, if that's okay. And I just posted a link to the text in the chat. <clears throat> okay. I like this piece, and it's finally started to rain here in Northern California for the first time in like many, many months. So we're very happy about that. I'm okay. happy about that. Okay. Uh, so here's the piece. It's called Rain Dreams. All right. Into the sack early Saturday night after a 15 mile walk on John Muir's trail. John O's and my sleeping bags sheltered by a crude tarp tent. Sleep comes easy and then dreams. Dan James and I are in a Volkswagen tank cruising the Arizona desert over the border into a deserted Mexican town. We raid a liquor store of its beer then haul ass back to my house. John O comes into the room and sits down. He picks up an empty bottle and holds it to the light. Then he gets up and leaves the room. Dan and I go to a friend's house, but no one is there except for a woman who is a witch or a ghost. She scares me, so we leave and go for more beer. But later I am drawn back, and though I know it's wrong, I find myself wanting this witch ghost. I come up to her and lift her dress. Not here, she says. If not here, then where? George James furnished the response question when reading the piece several years later, but still in the 1970s. He said he was going to keep the printed page as potentially valuable when D.A. Wilson became a famous poet. But it's a somewhat different version of Rain Dreams that has at last been published 35 years later in 2014. When John Muir came to San Francisco in 1868, he asked, what was the shortest way to the wilderness? He was told, take the ferry to Oakland. This was a joke. Here it comes, says John O, and I wake as the rain begins to fall in sheets. I pull myself into a hunched position trying to keep dry, but I soon sink back down into sleep. I am on a desolate street corner in endless Oakland with friends. Willie Q. Prankster and his old lady, and Ditch Osmosis, all dressed in flaming colors. We are standing there on the corner talking about rock music when suddenly a man appears across the street. He is staring at us, his body knotted and shaking, and we know without a doubt that he is incredibly deranged. In his hands, he holds a brown paper towel that is covered with white powder. The others flee as he begins to cross the street, but it is not until he is nearly upon me that I follow suit. He chases me around the corner into a landscape of swirling shapes and colors and lines. I think I have him beat, but my sight is ripped from my eyes and I look upon myself, mouth drawn back, ready to scream. The man pulling back my head and slapping that paper towel over my mouth and nostrils. Is it all in my mind? Dreams in my mind? Do all my poems have meanings? The unimaginable cold. Why this strange and cold weather? John O and I have walked the miles for miles in this pouring icy rain of the Sawtooth Range. The Idaho mountain gods dumping on us Wilsons. I wonder why and what we might have done to offend them. With grit and love, we will make amends to the fierce Idaho dream gods once we warm up. It was still dark when I was shaken awake by John O. When he, who said it was time to get up for school. I say shaken, but I can't really remember how he woke me up. My first memory was of feeling chilled because I was too hot last night there in the room, in my room. I was up and peeling off my damp undershirt. 
into the bathroom. I went to turn on the cold water and splash it in my eyes, but it didn't do the job. It was time to leave from home and drive into the day of school, but instead I dropped back down into mountain sleep. I woke again, drenched and cold. Try not to move, John O says. You retain much more body heat if you don't move. Teeth chattering, body aching. I hope for sleep to relieve my discomfort, but it only comes after I've forgotten wanting it. John O leads me into an art gallery in the city. There are paintings on the walls and wooden boxes with hinged lids. Not everyone can look into these boxes, John O says. John has to let you. John is the salesman. He is dressed in blue and looks like a vulture. He opens one of the boxes. Inside is a representation of a cash register. Attached to it is a price tag that reads $300. I go and sit down at a counter at the back of the room. John O disappears somewhere. There are fashion models walking around dressed in leotards and I am enjoying sitting there. A woman comes up to the counter and buys a painting and two tickets to a Rolling Stones concert next summer. I get up and follow the models down a hall that I discovered to be a hall at school. I pass an open room in which I can see Bill McDell teaching a class. He gives me a stern glance. I exit out onto the street and enter the theater I have been living in. It is old and huge. There is a large group of rowdy youths down near the orchestra pit who are tearing the seats apart. I am afraid to stay in the theater. It's pretty dark on the street and I stand looking at my reflection in a window. An attractive woman who looks loaded approaches and throws herself upon me. She kisses me and tells me that I look like a nice guy. I mumble a few confused words, but then we are joined by two men and another woman. Another woman. I lead the way through a door that fronts on the street and we are in a small apartment. Dan James is there and John, the salesman. Dan rolls a joint of dark green grass and sparks it up. Just as we finish the joint, there is a knock at the door. Dan answers it and a large group of people come in and start to party. I talk for a while to Willie Q Prankster and his old lady and ditch osmosis all dressed in flaming colors. And then I move towards the back of the apartment. I walk by Bill McDell, who is smiling and drinking a Rainier ale, and the lovely witch ghost says hello as I pass her in the hall. She looks very pretty. I am very, very stoned. The mountains are cold and clean, with the air flavored pine fresh, the deer moving with grace over the damp green meadows, the bear fire-eyed foraging amongst the trees, the lion roaring betwixt granite rocks, sun splashing orange through the rain and sounds of wildlife that transforms into a city conversation with Felix Felix and Newton Drydock as I moved toward the back of the apartment. I passed by my brother Daniel who was drinking a bottle of wine and the lovely witch ghost said hello when I passed her in the hall. She looked very pretty. I was very, very stoned and could relate to conversation only through nods and smiles. I went outside through a back door and into a small storage area where I tried to mellow down a bit. When I thought I had it together, I re-entered only to find that I was at home in bed trying to wake up and start the morning and go to school. I was wet from night sweats. When I looked in the mirror, my eyes were dilated and red as if I'd been smoking grass. And now I am at a large school campus on a cloudy day. I am smiling. I have never been there before, but it is somehow familiar. A play is performed and I participate in some obscure forgotten way. Then my head explodes into a series of helter-skelter events grown cloudy like the day. I think about sitting down by a girl that I saw at a McDougal's hamburger stand in Fresno. And I hear that you can have a Bob Dylan concert in your own home for only $6. John O reappears and we roll some bicycle tires back to the John Muir Trail where I suddenly awaken 
twist gray Sierra Dawn, stiff and with hands frozen blue. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for uh, indulging me. I know I went on for a ways there. Well, that was all right. Yeah. Um, I, I have a couple of questions to ask you, uh, yes. first of all. Uh, sorry you got interrupted with the chat line. Uh, some okay. people just don't fucking get it. All right. It wasn't uh, a distraction maybe to they, me. Maybe when they read, we can chat all over their poem. Yeah, anyway, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Or eliminate them for participating if they can't withhold their, their oh, urges. You're pretty strict, Mo. No, I'm not. I'm trying to no, give I know you're to not. everyone who reads. Anyone, everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. Deserves full attention. You know, really, you know. So anyway, <laughs> what I wanted to say was um, the, oh boy. <laughs> what I wanted to say was um, that psychologists tell us that most of us have bad dreams, okay? Because uh, there was a time way, way back when I thought, oh, what's wrong with me? I have so many bad dreams. And then things you talked about, they indicate that we all often feel that we go to somewhere uh, that we know about you know, like a house. And then once we get in it, we're lost. Yeah. You know, and so um, yeah. your poem is original. However, it does seem to follow what psychologists tell us are typical maps in our dreams, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think that uh, we, I mean, we all, you know, you know, there's like that Jung's uh, co collective unconsciousness and the archetypes. And it's sort of like maybe we're all kind of wired similarly in our subconscious and our dream life so we have similar patterns and motifs and stuff that uh, appear mm -hmm. now i want to ask you another question that i think is amusing you kept right. saying you know you were stoned or i am stoned can someone be both dreaming and stoned well apparently so <laughs> in that does, instance. That make, does that make you like in a sense uh, outside of <laughs> Normal reality, a double winner or something? Oh, yeah. yeah I yeah. guess, yeah, it's all right. I mean, last, well, last night I, I dreamt I was stoned and I was with a friend of mine in Marquisian and I had a love affair with him and he gave me a joint and I was I was stoned in my dream and I woke up on this, you know, in this. Yeah, moment. you don't have to score or anything. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering about that. So, uh, yeah, this may seem kind of weird, but do you actually then in your head feel different in your dream consciousness that I'm dreaming and stoned? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think what I, and I, that was a long time ago, you know, that I had those actual dreams, but uh, it's it's exactly. pretty much as described, you know, and I, I like how, you know, it was the shifting time and place and all that kind of stuff. The shifting okay. time and place is the, is the key exactly but the question is whether there is an actual time duration in a dream uh -huh. they're just events one just constantly shifting so it's i don't think it. it's the same passage of time as in our waking life it's different uh -huh. i yeah uh -huh. i don't, don't think it's different it's the same yeah okay what happened to the night sweats it's a it's a curse i mean you know when it really happens. yeah i never knew so, I thought it vanished into thin air. And I'm not sure whether in that it's like, you know, it's the night sweats or was it being because, you know, I was asleep and soaked to the skin. And it was my dad I was on that walking trip with. And, uh, oh. and uh, yeah, and that was the okay. big joke. And then the next morning he said, well, do you want to continue up the trail? I said, no. <laughs> he said, me neither. And the, the big joke about my 22 pound sleeping bag because it had it had soaked up so much water during the night. <laughs> the, other element of, the other element about dreams is uh, uh, I've experienced it, and it is said that we have a very difficult time remembering the dream, and it's most helpful if we write it down immediately upon waking. That's true. I, f I found that to be true. Because uh, I've, had, uh, I, I've had some really good dreams and wit. Anyway, it's always with the good dreams. Like, I want to know every detail of that again. Yeah. Run that movie again. Well, you don't the nightmares, want the not so much. 
Yes. You don't want the aspect of the nightmares. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Which and you're yeah. always wishing us, Benedicta. To terrible nightmares. <laughs> and I'll definitely <laughs> wish you the same today. <laughs> well, and to you too. And the difference, may, here's something too that I think is rather, uh, it fascinates me. In uh, older times, in ancient times, and even today among indigenous peoples, people regard dreams as true messages and symbols of their reality. You know, I saw it in a dream, and so I acted on it, I was told. And um, whereas the, under, the common understanding today uh, in most, uh, in the Western culture anyway, is they're not to be seen as, uh, as, as signs, you know, from the right. spirit world. Yeah, yeah. And then that's the whole gets into shamanism and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah. And uh, let me just say briefly, so I had an experience with my family in the backwoods. Uh, we, uh, we encountered uh, Bigfoot, Sasquatch. We saw two of them, and um, which uh, was just an amazing experience. Um, and then many years later, I was reading about uh, the native tribes up there in that area, far northern California, and how they they knew about the Sasquatch. They said, "Oh yes, they're out there," but their medicine men said, "Well, they're they're spiritual. They're spiritual creatures. They mm -hmm. exist out there, but they're not necessarily existing in the same uh, plane as us." Which that explained to me why nobody's ever you know been able to uh, bring one back. They're the, they're, some people think they're the same as uh, the Loch Ness monster and flying saucers. Yeah, yeah. Meaning, they, you know, there's something weird going on though. That's for sure. And they were aware of it. That the point was, they were aware of it back, you know, before the arrival of the Europeans and stuff like that. Yeah, well, yeah, well, the Europeans brought a lot of bad things too. They sure did. <laughs> Killed them all. <laughs> Killed all those people. Uh, I'm just fascinated by it because one, there's there's a return of a lot of uh, um, uh, interest in and people, the science community, trying to research what goes on in the brain when we dream, and they're not really coming up with any real hard proof. So we keep on dreaming, right? We keep on dreaming, and with all this uh, advanced technology, neuroscience, you know, and, right. and bioneurology and things like that. Uh, they can't come up with why in the hell, what does it mean? They know what happens in our brains, you know, with the rapid eye movement and all that, but they don't really, and so they can't uh, define it, they can't agree with each other. Is it just a brain mechanism or part of consciousness detached from the normal function of the dream? And so it, it's, yeah, yeah. What is, Let's hope they never get to the bottom of it. Isn't there a song, um, You're Only Innocent When You Dream? Yes, Tom Waits. Tom Waits, yeah. Oh. You're innocent oh. when you dream. Oh, We're yeah. laughing through the graveyard. <laughs> <laughs> but you're innocent when you dream. Wow. Well, okay. Because I've been having quite a few lately, and I'm, I'm sure that's because I'm spending so much time in seclusion. Less right. distraction. And... Uh, some of them are, are good, but some of them are just typical. Nothing to write about, you know. I'm in my old house. How come I'm lost? <laughs> I'm in my old neighborhood, and I'm so happy. Where'd everybody go? <laughs> I'm late. Two minutes, Mo Singer. I'm late. You know, some typical stuff that do not merit any more than that kind of just, you know, off-the-cuff uh, observations. That's funny. Because houses I dream about are never places I've ever been in. Uh oh, well, Billy, you're uh, hey, hey, you're out of the, you're off the norm there. Uh, I have been, Mo. <laughs> <laughs> more points to the poet, Bill. More poet <laughs> points right there. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. So let's move on to our next poet here and invite on Jack Cooper. Hello, Jack. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Can I do a share screen or what? Uh, here's the thing again. I'll hit the button, okay? And so it's 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 showing me your uh, okay. 
So what might I do next? Does that appear on, on your, can you guys visualize what I just did? Okay. Yeah. I, I hit you. I think it's down at the bottom. I see it on your screen. Can, okay, Jack, can you see the image that I can see, which is a rectangle? Uh, no. That's interesting. Um, okay, I'm going to hit a button again here. Oh, okay. now what do you... Oh, now what do you so i'm looking at mo at your screen uh you don't need to see that yeah jesus okay i mean it, as it happens i have a poem about dreams that oh good uh, well how do I well I, I just gotta apologize i gotta i have to uh boat up on that on how to make that work because we have had it work in the past and that was when mo Mo, Mo Elise was, was teching for us. Okay, so you have disabled participant screen sharing. I just did now, unless you want me to, because when I turned it on, okay. I think you were only seeing my, you know, my, uh, my, my, you weren't seeing what you wanted to put up, right? right. Okay. See, there it is again. And, I'm uh, sure it's from there, because you started a recording. If it was uh, done before, you might well, I, have been able to I mean, see, it should be, make it available for all of us to share our screen. I don't think so. You know why, Benedict? Because uh, Mo had, record, had us in recording while, uh, for instance, El Habib was on share screen and we were seeing his text. Yeah. So I think... Uh, um, yeah, usually there's a green something at the bottom that will say. And that's, yeah, that's what I've turned on, Jack. It's bright green. It says oh, there share. share screen. Okay. Right. And you so. You can check the meeting setting. Now it's saying that you've disabled it. <laughs> See, there it is, turned on. And now there's, that was with the green button. Now if I go to the bottom right, there's a blue I, uh, a blue note there that says share. And when I do that, it's only showing, it only allows me to share. You know what it's doing? It's only allowing me to share the screen. Ah, that's not what we... Well, then let's move on. Yeah, let, let's disable this and... Um, but... Whoop, there we go. I have to be seeing your screen because there's some things on my own that I'd like to see. Right, right. Uh, here, I'm trying to get it off now. Uh, Jesus. Let's see how I can get it off. No, I'm trying to disable it. Okay. okay. Now we're back to Hollywood Squares. Yeah. I, I'm sorry about that, people. No, no uh, problem. I'm learning as I go along, and you can see that, that I'm due to stay after school. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, was, I came across, I, I was looking at um, an old copy of the Hudson Review recently. Wow, the Hudson Review. Yeah, yeah. And um, I found, a, and there's a poem in here, which I, I remember, you know, when I first got this in the mail. It's called, um, it's by someone named Robert McDowell. And it's okay. called Boxing with Sylvia Beach. Woo. Which I... <laughs> From Shakespeare and Company. Uh, yeah, I thought this, this would be fun to hear. Is this okay. your poem or someone else's? No, it's by someone named Robert McDowell. Okay. Boxing with Pound wasn't as easy as you'd think. He was wiry. He was quick. And for a poet, he could take a punch. Smacking Joyce around was like punching a croissant. Sure, you could make excuses. Yes, he was half blind, but Hemingway wanted to knock your head off the moment he put the gloves on. He punch out his own mother if he got in the if she got in the ring come to think of it he hated his mother other than him mcalman 
was the best boxer among them. But who cares now? It's shame. For some reason, nobody pays attention to McGalman anymore. Sylvia Beach was tougher than all of them put together. She was selfless and committed. She just looked at you and you fell. Ooh, all right. That, that was good. That's good, huh? Yeah. yeah they, they say Joyce was a croissant, but his wife wasn't because there's a, a story believed to be so true that when Joyce lived in Paris, uh, the reigning philosopher of the day was Andre Gide, who lived in Paris. And Andre Gide made a call on James Joyce's house. And so he went up to the door and rang the bell or knocked or whatever. And uh, 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 <clears throat> James's wife, is that Nora, right? Nora. And Nora yes. answered the door and he said, hi, I'm here. I'm here to see James. And she said, just a minute, please. I'll tell him. So she came back in, in, in a brief time and said, uh, uh, James, James does not want to have any visitors. And then Gide is supposed to have said, tell him this is Andre Gide. And she said, I tell you, he's James Joyce. <laughs> It was Nick uh, uh, yeah. McAllister. Was that uh, Morley? Was his name Morley? No, it was Robert McAlman. McAlman. Robert McAlman, one of my favorite characters from that he's, time. He's in a great he was a great character. Yeah, he's actually he's actually the guy who who typed Ulysses from it uh, from the manuscript. Right. But there's a there's a story about a Canadian writer named Morley something who was also a boxer. That Hemingway had a had a boxing yeah. match with. Oh, okay. And he 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 landed a good too good a punch and he, and got knocked out. And he always blamed um, um what's his name? Uh, Tender is the night. Um, Scott Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald for not ringing the bell on time. <laughs> that's like Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah. And that's a story about. Uh, I heard that. Uh, James Joyce and uh, Samuel Beckett were meeting each other and by the fire and they were spending nights without telling a single word. A single word, yeah. You heard that. Yeah. yeah, and you know, that relationship ended, unfortunately, for Beckett. He was a young man as Joyce was advanced in his eight years and Joyce wanted uh, Beckett, his interest in receiving Be Beckett in visits and so forth, was to convince Beckett that he should begin courting Joyce's daughter. Okay. Yeah. It yeah. was crazy. And, yeah. And she, uh, she was a piece of work because she, was she autistic or she had some kind of mental problem? She was schizophrenic. Schizophrenic. schizophrenic yeah. And, and, and mm. so, what happened was Beckett right away, um, according to this story, you know, just said, oh, no way, this isn't going to work. And then the story goes to Joyce I've then. You. I've got too many eggs to lay. <laughs> <laughs> and then Joyce then rapidly lost interest in, lost interest in Beckett. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's also, there's also a story Does that. Does that sound that strange? Mm. What's that? I said it sounded strange. People do that, Benedicta. They do that. There, <clears throat> there's. Uh, yeah. I mean, I love that period in the twenties and the thirties in Paris. Yeah. And, uh, and McGalman was. I've never read any of his books. They're supposed to be. Oh, you should read his uh, "Being Geniuses" together. Great book. Yeah, and there's one called "The Village," I think. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting because it talks about his growing up in in the Midwest and being in love with Eugene Vidal, who was the father of Gore Vidal. Wow. Right, right. Um, wow. And of course, Gore, uh, Gore Vidal is the uh, uncle of Al Gore. Right, yeah. Um, right. You know what? Uh, according to that, too, that so many people believe, according to that, that they're actually not related, Gore Vidal at the really? end of his life. Uh, I've read a lot on Gore Vidal. I did this. I like his 
novels, and, and I really love his essays. He's got two great collections of essays. Yeah. He was a great historian that was shunned because he told too much truth because he well, was raised. Well, he was a traitor to his class. No, he was raised too close to power, which is right. As a boy, he was led into the White House and. Gore Vidal. Who are you talking about? Gore Vidal. Was okay. an, an American writer and intellectual and historian. I don't and, know him. And he was, a, a, he was briefly a lover with Anais Nin. And okay. uh, then went full blown. <laughs> And then went full blown gay, and Anais felt betrayed ever since then. And they had their own version of Twitter, where where they were they were criticizing each other in printed public uh, documents. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it, regarding his sexuality, I mean, his his two his two rules of thumb in life, if that if you can say call say, talk about two rules of thumb, where one is never. Never miss up, never miss a, an opportunity for sex. The other was never miss an opportunity to be on TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, cool. Those cool. were two conflicting worlds. Now, now, Benedicta, you were saying that was strange about uh, the relate with Joyce and Beckett and the daughter, but I tell mm -hmm. you, in the late in the late eighties, I was uh, participating in the national, how was it called, Jack? National Poetry Foundation. Uh, the, you know that the, they always uh, the, the happens in now the one in Stanhope, uh, New Jersey, uh, where they gather all the who's who's poets. Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it'll come to me, and and that, that's when they rein in the who's who of the, uh, the 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 poetry chieftains rein in the who's who. So I went there and 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 had uh, got some brief reading time, and I was approached in a hotel room by one of the in poets and her name was Ruth Stone. And and she said to meet her in her, her hotel room later, she wanted to talk to me. So I did. And she praised um, one or two poems I read and told me that I could come to an annual roundup can, um, can, uh, invited by uh, Robert Bly in the woods with campfires and all this and that all the notable poets where we're privately, by invitation only, invited to this, as Ruth Stone was invited to this, and Ruth was was telling me that on her uh, on her uh, connection, I would be able to come there as well, and I was very happy and excited about that. And as soon as she uh, as soon as she told me that, she started showing me pictures of her daughter, <laughs> and she said her daughter had uh, left uh, the community and was living in a small, like, uh, earth-built uh, home in Vermont, and that I should get in touch with the daughter, and I would be very interested to meet the daughter. She was sure the daughter would meet me. So I looked up the daughter a little bit online back then um, and found out, no way, this poor girl's going through a, a massive depression. She, she wants to be isolated. She doesn't even know who I am. So I dropped my interest and told Ruth that in a letter. And as a result, I never heard from Ruth Stone <laughs> or the roundup with Robert Bly uh, in the woods of Wisconsin or whatever. So, you know, it does happen. I had a colleague who had written a book about her daughter's life. And one day um, she showed me a nude picture of her daughter telling me how, saying, isn't she beautiful? The daughter was gay. <laughs> <laughs> she was oh, hot. Really? Yeah, but, but I mean, you know. So what? You can be gay and you can be beautiful. You can look at a woman without uh, that's wanting not, to That's not the point. It, that's not the point, Isabel. The point is she didn't. You can look at a woman without. Isabel, looking. Isabel, that's not the point. The point is she was gay. She didn't want to be hooked up with me. Oh, oh I am bad. bisexual, and I, if I am gay, I don't mind if a man uh, look at me. If he doesn't have a healthy desire. Persistent. <laughs> what, Benedicta? <laughs> I thought Bill should have been persistent. He would have been able to grab her. To what? You can never tell. To I what? thought you should have been persistent. Her assistant. 
I'm saying he should have been persistent in his want to date her and all that. No, 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 no. Listen to the story. Listen to what I said. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, I handled I, it right, Bill. Huh? I, you handled it correctly, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I knew not to be persistent with the daughter of Ruth Stone, and I never looked back on it, even though I lost that that very wonderful invitation I thought I had. You know. The Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation. Oh, yeah, I've heard of them. I said the that Dodge I went Festival. to. Huh? You said the Dodge Festival. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the, the Dodge Festival is where I went and met Ruth Stone. And by the way, poor Ruth was desperate. Um, she came home one night and found her husband hung dead in the bathroom. Ouch. Yeah, so she had shared that part also. So the glorious life of the of the artist, huh? Oh yes. So anyway, the invitations and the offers we get, woo woo woo. <laughs> yeah. I mean anyway, uh so Jack. <laughs> yeah. As we got off the the beaten path of, uh, you're about to read your second poem, if I remember. Would that be right? That is correct. Very good. Hey, I finally got one That's thing right good. tonight. Hey, I got one thing right today. Are you counting on your fingers or what? Well, that's about all I can count on with what I've got right tonight. I'm back. <laughs> okay, Benedict, you're back. Now we're going to hear Jack read his okay. second second <clears throat> poem. This is called Love among the clouds. How beautiful our world tonight, especially its cloud parade. Beneath the moon, removed halfway to entice. Wishes shredded, pleas torn, almost aloud from their mouth. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting. <laughs> you want to answer that? <laughs> no, I don't. It's a, it's a, it's a call from your <laughs> <laughs> This is our night. This is our night. <laughs> yeah, truly. Uh, all right. Okay, okay here we go. Start again, please, I'm Jack. Not enough. I'm not answering. Okay. Can we? That, there we go. Okay, we're done. So it's called <laughs> Love Among the Clouds. How beautiful our world tonight, especially its clouds parade beneath the moon, removed halfway to entice. Wishes shredded, pleas torn, almost aloud from their mouths. Oh, give me, take me, Wrapped in colors, full with radiance, your exertions. Wow. Thumbs up. Back on the trail of romance. Yeah. All right. It's good to mix it up with themes. And that was certainly uh, timely to introduce something romantic like that. Yeah. In fact, actually, so, I'll, I'll finish with something um, please. more romantic. This is called <clears throat> Mercy. Merci, mercy, mercy. The resistant crescent, hard like a moon, imagined in your pants, your Trousers between your legs, to which you guided me with your own hand. I strummed as our guitar, and you moaned until crescendo reached. You screamed a timber that made my heart trill. A look of wonder exposed my face. I loved you then and always will ever 
never forget whatever you do or may do i take to heart your being flows in my blood with love i shall not forsake that trust in your soul that faith of affection my creed since i lost god mm. well there is a statement yeah. there is a statement Loves a bit. i always like to, i always like to ask the poets who read these romantic pieces have they sent them uh, to uh, the person, uh, let's be PC here. Oh, there weren't two people. Uh, Let me put it that way. Sorry, there now? weren't two people. It was a, a person. One person. Okay, a person, right? So, did the, uh, I presume that was a woman in your case. Did you send that poem to the woman? Uh, I actually uh, recited it. Even better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you recall, uh, was she moved? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you're allowed to say it. You're allowed to say it. Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. Isn't that nice? Oh, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> that, All right. Yeah, it's, um, it's a great favorite of mine because of, uh, I mean, it was real self-discovery, you know. Mm -hmm. I creed. Yeah. I love God. I mean, I mean your 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 love runs in my blood. That's alchemy. Yeah. I mean that's there you go. Okay. You now hang on to the conversation. I'm gonna grab a book because I think I'm next here. Okay. <laughs> wow. Oh, so. I, I, I'm tempted to quickly not, you know, I'm not trying to overreach here, but oh, here's no, go, go ahead. What, what do you continue? What do you wish to say? Well, you know, we were having that that conversation about money, which made me think of of a poem that. Uh, that I knew once upon a time that I okay. found, called money. By a guy named uh, Dana Joya. Okay, we're going to hear from another poet by way of Jack, please. Where is it? I just had it. So he's good. I had it up and then she I uh, Well that seems to be the nature of this evening. <laughs> yeah, right. you know, it's true. I mean, you know, just don't ask me to share a screen. <laughs> we are technical wizards. <laughs> yeah, right. That's why I'm gonna get sent to summer school. <laughs> where are the where are the seven year olds when you need <laughs> Dang. <laughs> uh, it's called Money, and it has an epigraph from uh, Wallace Stevens, which is, money is a kind of poetry. <laughs> money, the long green, cash, stash, rhino, jack, or just plain dough. Chalk it up, fork it over, shell it out. Watch it burn holes through pockets. To be made of it, have it burn. Greenbacks, double eagles, mega bucks, and Ginny Mays. Greases the palm, feathers a nest, holds heads above water, makes both ends meet. Money breeds money, mm. gathering interest, compounding daily always in circulation money you don't know where it's been but you put it where your mouth is <laughs> 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 
and it talks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Juliet! Oh, Juliet! <laughs> that was Money good. Doesn't talk it screams. That was good. All right. Hey, it was good to hear that. All right, I'm going to read um, two poems here. And uh, uh, lately, what I what I like what I've done for a long time is think I know what I'm going to read, not just here, but when we go to normal uh, in-person readings. And then I, I, I feel a flow, a current through the uh, reading, and that determines which poem I'm going to read. And I kind of like that. You know, I like to. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I remember in the early days thinking, I'm going to read this one poem and it's going to knock everybody out. And just when I thought that that one knockout poem was going to work, the response from the audience was, whatever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if I it was unplanned, then I would find out the poems were very popular, unexpected to me. So that's what I don't know about my own stuff. So I'm going to read one that's on the vein of um, lust. Okay, let's go from romance to lust. Um, this is called 4 a.m. We are, dog, not you two. Okay, 4 a.m. We arrived at your place. It was very late. I on a second wind, you on a blind date. Anxious movement, the vein in my neck. I was hard and you were wet, sweat and perfume, the air heavy with us. You took my tongue, sucked like an artichoke heart, and I ran fingers through your hair, cleaving creases on the back of your neck, jungle cats on a mating call, drawn deeper swollen as it was, sliding down the ravenous oval made of your mouth, gums throbbing, lips dripping, fingers sheathed in sugarous saliva, mere touch to your nipple rose like a buoy, porous brown bobbing atop ivory breast. Magnetic charge in a rapturous storm Hot steak rising from quivering thighs, lava rush about to spew, taking three deep, slow breaths, plunging the tongue for more, second time good as the first. <clears throat> Very good. Yeah, that was a blind date. Uh, okay, now for something completely different. Um, I'm going to read my Christmas poem. And um, here I am, a blasphemer and a heretic and someone who left the uh, monotheism belief system very young. I did not notice to note the good things done by people of religion. You know, Francis of Assisi feeding the poor, Baruch Spinoza telling people to get out of the cold temples and into the flow of life. You know, there are various religions. Thomas Merton, you know, the national poet of Nicaragua. So, so there are people. Uh, okay, so anyway, so I want you to know that because um, uh, people, uh, but because it might surprise you given my belief system how this goes. Anyway, it goes like this. And what happened is this. Um, a long time ago, I was at a wine and cheese party with all the the right progressive people, including somebody I really liked, uh, Becky Newland. And Becky Newland uh, practiced liberation theology, you know, which is a radical departure from the dogma and the doctrine of the church. And Becky Newland was there, and we were both dipping our fingers in, um, yeah, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, the stuff, the finger food, and uh, we were talking about. Uh, how, how poorly things were going, particularly for the lower classes, you know, the unemployment, unaffordability to pay for life, and, you know, oppressive scoundrels in office. So, and she said, well, Mo, what are we going to do? And I said, well, Becky, I don't know. I'll ask Santa Claus. 
you ask God. And so I went home later that night and I wrote this poem and sent it to Becky. Now, and she uh, reproduced this poem. She was a, uh, a Catholic school, Catholic high school teacher. So she reproduced this poem and gave it to other friend teachers in the high school system. And they handed it out to their students because this was written on December 7th. And uh, the students then read the poem and were asked to comment on their feelings about uh, the holiday season, particularly Christmas. And uh, just it was circulating through different Catholic high school classes when the Archbishop of Paris found uh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, he found out about it and he sent a memo out ordering that that poem be immediately stopped, that it no longer be in distribution. And so to keep their jobs, they immediately stopped that poem. So, <laughs> Jesus, I knew I did something right. <laughs> so, you know, like when, so like when the sister said, hey, Michael, what are you giving up for Lent? Uh, cartoon sister. Hey, Mary Ellen, what are you giving up for Lent? Candy sister. Hey, Mo, what are you giving up for Lent? Religion sister. <laughs> anyway, here's the poem. And he goes, and it's called Ask. Uh, I'll ask Santa Claus, you ask God. Come late December, a blanket of snow needs to fall soft and quiet upon the jagged quilt of our land, that a fresh wind may sweep clean old maples and pines to cool our busy heads and tempers, that we may look, listen, in curiosity, innocence, babes, and ourselves. I'll ask Santa Claus, and you ask God, to set one star apart, brilliant, in shimmering, stirring waves of hope, of faith, across the nighttime sky, for all to claim. To a nighttime drifter who would cradle a fallen sparrow in the cups of his hands, feeding his fellow creature from the milk of his heart, this being purpose, this being meaning. I'll ask Santa Claus, you ask God, to make up small pleasures like magic, gifts for an orphan, and multiply this child's vision shaped in his dreams that he may lend generously to every child in need of laughter. I'll ask Santa Claus and you ask God, do you think they might turn with the bend of wide maples and tall pines and blow upon the winds to give direction as the cold night sky soothes the pain of a drifter lost, a sparrow fallen, and brighten the eyes of our needy neighbors. Jesus, seeing the same, routed the money lenders. Turning to the hungry, turning to the hungry, we shall have our loaves and fishes. Pray you, do these deeds in spirit, in acts. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the, and the Pharisee sent the soldier for the priest to bury the intellectuals to heal for the children to witness. I'll ask Santa Claus and you ask God. We're not asking for much. A fresh white blanket of snow, soft and wet upon the cheeks, a lone star shining fire in the hearts of men. Peace settles. All is calm. All is bright. Waken. I wonder what the Archbishop's objection was to your poem. Uh, Santa Claus. Santa Claus. Santa right. Claus. There you yeah, go. There you, right there. There you go. And, and you know, um, I probably, you know, the fact that um, I didn't say uh, this is for all and not to the believer. I didn't say to the followers, 
to the flock, to the faithful, for all to claim. And, you know, I, I, I would imagine that was it. The archbishop didn't give a, a an explanation, just a command. He probably figured this fellow's too clever by half. And <laughs> yeah, and, and, and shut him up. <laughs> we're also doing it. Like like George Carlin said in that famous thing that was uh, was you know there's a there's a there's a priest about to give mass and a younger priest goes up and goes hey father what is it there's a guy in the back causing quite a disturbance what do you mean he's wearing sandals and dirty clothes and got a long beard <laughs> yeah. get him out of here the father he seems to be walking out air I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody with you know crutches. His kind in our church. Somebody with crutches just stood up. I'm calling the Pope. <laughs> it was kind of like, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Carlin yeah. really could talk about Catholicism. Yeah, he goes, uh, frankly, those of us who uh, took the uh, teachings very seriously and then read what you might call the literature, you know, the. Uh, uh, the Bible and all that. I was very uh, profoundly moved, particularly by the Old Testament. That's a lot of action. That is a lot of action, you know. Joshua in the Battle of Jericho and wandering through the desert and bondage out of Egypt and, and all that stuff. And I thought it was quite amazing. And then uh, I saw, saw it as allegory and metaphor, you know, and that's when I parted ways. <clears throat> Hey, did you ever hear the story about how uh, Gary Snyder lost his Christianity? No. He, he, uh, as a, he was a boy, and they had a little lamb there in their farm or something, some little animal that he was fond of, and the little animal died. And Gary, young Gary said to the, to the local priest, well, at least my little lamb is up in heaven now. And he said, oh, no, no, animals don't go to heaven. And they said, well, I don't want to go either. <laughs> and that was the end of that. <laughs> I don't want to go to your heaven then. If my, yeah. you know, that's how I feel. My cats and my dogs aren't there. What's the yeah, point? because uh, when I was a kid, it was, it was said that animals don't have souls. Right. right. And, uh, uh, and, and do and, you to say women don't have soul and Indians don't have souls? Yeah, uh, right. No, they say women. <laughs> They yes, didn't say that. They used to say that. I wow. know. Far, 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 uh, in the beginning of, uh, I mean, in, in the in the beginning of the center is the church. Church Jesus said that. Church. Said that. Well, yeah. I could see how they would I'm go with that. I'm thinking those ones are myths. I could see how they would uh, deny animal souls, but but the Virgin Mary is one of the holiest figures in all Christianity. So I would have a hard time believing any Christian of any, any sort would no, deny. But after uh, uh, so Holy Paul, and uh, that, that uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, at the time they said that, not very long, but hmm. I heard that uh, when I was a child. Hmm. I had a Catholic. Uh, they are all in the Bible, though. So. Mm. And then they used to say the Jews killed Jesus and forgot to tell us that Jesus was a Jew. Right. <laughs> <laughs> See, Jesus was born. What I know is that they. Go ahead. They yeah. made thorns and they said he's the king of the Jews. Yeah. On yeah well, his he was crucifixion Jewish. day. Yeah. On his crucifixion day, they made thorns and they, they inscripted on it the king of the Jews. Yeah, that was the Romans. Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judaiorum. That was the Romans mocking him. Mocking him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the Romans. Mm -hmm. Here's your king of the Jews. You know. But yeah. that was interesting because it, they would say the Jews killed Jesus, and we were to imagine that, oh wow, baby Jesus was born a Catholic. <laughs> and then <laughs> and then the Jews went out and killed him. <laughs> right, sister? Well, something like that, James. <laughs> <laughs> now eat your fish on Friday. <laughs> because, uh, in Hebrew, his name is Yeshua. Yes. Yeshua, you know. Uh, so, uh, and there's this whole backlash now among um, uh, uh, Jews 
uh, um, 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 uh, going there. I'm listening to them because I like eating up some of this stuff. I'm a nerd who are, are really on the road to saying, giving these lectures on why Jesus never existed and uh, why why the uh, the New Testament is a total fraud. So there's just all this backlash going on. <laughs> Unlike People, the Old Testament, right? It, well, man, it was fire. No fraud yeah. involved there. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, they did a lot of stuff, and that's why you like the Old Testament. You know, I like the Christmas. Yeah, and, and um, what, what I like to recall to people who talk about the, the, the justified war, you know, uh, they get into it. With, you know, those people are different. Justified war. And I go, okay there, Rocco, <laughs> Sluggo. Uh, quote the part where Jesus said, slaughter your enemies. Uh, quote the part where Jesus said, uh, um, the Gentiles cannot be admitted into the faith. Quote that part. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Because when they wanted him to pick up, according to the stories, when they went to him and said, Jesus, carry the sword, that's when he said, No. I, I, I will not I will not reign as as a warrior. And then at that time, the Jews had a, a, a strict obeyance that you did not uh, you did not uh, reach out or try to convert the non-Jews. It's called the Gentiles. And when in the Bible, as it goes, when he was put to that, he went, no, no, no. You know, <laughs> everyone is welcome. And so that's why they had to they had to kill him. Because uh, you know, um, you know, throwing the money lenders out of the temple and saying we're all equal and people who don't have the Jewish faith are just as valuable as we are, they had to kill him. Now, whether that's uh, half myth or all myth, the point is that was uh, I was considered uh, after I left um, monotheist belief that Jesus was in fact a very revolutionary character for two thousand years ago. Because Absolutely. in that part of the world, you slaughtered the defeated. You slaughtered them. And, there's, and, a lot of, there's a lot of that in the Bible, slaughters of the defeated. Yeah. And you, uh, that, that book, uh, The Da Vinci Code, the, oh. the theory, in that, it was stolen from a serious book. Huh? Okay. Uh, called uh, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Uh -huh. and, yes, I've watched it before. Have you watched the movie before? Yeah, the, the the movie's garbage. The book is garbage, but there's yeah. a, it's from a serious book. They really, really acted it well. How to find the Holy Grail? They added CIA and all that. It was I don't know if you've seen the new the latest version. It was really one of a kind. Yeah, well, uh, but can, the book you're referring to, Bill? Yeah, Holy it's called Lord. Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and the idea yes, is. The idea, the idea was that um, Jesus, in fact, was a was a Jewish revolutionary, and that he was not killed. It was uh, he was <coughs> not killed, and that the Merovingian dynasty in France were descended from from Jesus and yeah. Mary Magdalena, who was his wife, <coughs> and that they uh, they still exist, and uh, well. I don't know how, how valid this theory is. Apparently it's not, it lacks a certain amount of proof, but mm -hmm. I think it's a good alternative. Well, I ain't seen anybody walking on water lately. <laughs> Let well, me know. That, that's it. it. They, 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 they took, that. they took exception to the, to the idea that Jesus was, uh, was uh, a God, a God like, that Jesus was just a man. He was a, uh, Jewish revolutionary. Yeah. Now that they found in the Gnostic Gospels and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Vatican put the put the hammer, put the hammer down and said suppress all that, suppress all of it. Mm -hmm. There are whole sections in the Dead Sea Scrolls that that one of the chief interpreters talks about, saying that there's so much information in the Dead Sea Scrolls that there is an agreement with the Vatican that it shall not be revealed because it would turn uh, canon law and, and, ca and Catholic and Christian doctrine upside down. Egalitarianism, communalism, 
equality for women, women leaders in the early followers, things like that, uh, that came out of the Gnostic Gospels, especially the Gospel of Philip. And then, like I said, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, I don't know what was in it. But the interpreter, who's Israeli, you know, uh, the Jewish, said that uh, there's an agreement with the Vatican that we never reveal the contents uh, uh, of what was in the scrolls because it would turn Christianity on its head. <laughs> so, so much, you know. And, uh, and other, other secret, another secret is the... Uh, um, Fatima, the message of Fatima, that supposedly right. when it was given to the Pope, he fainted dead away. And supposedly one of the one of the messages is that uh, the 21st century will be Chinese. <laughs> well, you got that part right. <laughs> Bill, I know where I'm buying my next cell phone. My next cell phone, Hoi. <laughs> it's crazy. But they just. It can be so well dissected, you know, there's some good parts and some bad parts and the trouble is people get so insecure. The Muslims are the same way. One in every five people on earth is a Muslim and yet leave the religion and they all act totally insecure like they're losing ground, you know, and and, and you may have an opinion on what the, the Israeli state is doing to the Palestinians. It's like, you know. And the Hindus with, with Modi right now, Jesus, Hindu nationalism. He is what we thought Donald Trump was going to be. Modi is a proto-fascist. So. Oh, man. The ones that really uh, perplex me are the, the, uh, the violent Buddhists <laughs> in various parts of the world. <laughs> right, because... They're like, wait a minute. What am I missing here? <laughs> uh, yeah, because what was it 15 years ago or something? There was a big national strike in Korea, South Korea, yeah. and it really divided the population. And there are these videos of these Buddhist monks uh, in um, Seoul coming out of their uh, their building and running down the steps, kicking the shit out of people. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, <laughs> uh -oh, there it is. Okay. Wow. Buddhist monks, tougher than you might think. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, let's just blaspheme away tonight. <laughs> they learned from the Shaolin monks, right? I'm not sure you should get that Da Vinci Code movie and watch it. It's, it, uh -huh. it has a lot. It's that deep. Uh huh. Well, I, I'm, I'm game. The I'm game. Research, uh, I'm it's game. big trouble because he was able to reveal most of their top secrets. Mm -hmm. where they keep the Holy Grail and how they coded it. Yeah. Because some lost their lives in finding it and he was a researcher. Yeah. They well, didn't want anyone to unravel what they do. Right. I mean, you know, and if you go to Italy, uh, as I, I did, you know, you, I was in Venezia, in Venice, and, and you see a church where it goes, for a small fee, of course, uh, you can enter this church and see one of the bones of Jesus Christ. And then you walk uh, 500 yards down, down the street and you, you stop at a church and he goes, for a small price, see the bones of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and they do that. <laughs> you can find Jesus. Well, the Venetians knew about making money too, right? <laughs> hey, you know, when I was a, a child, when I lost my parents, I, I, uh, I, I have it now. I, uh, it was in my... Uh, parents' uh, bedroom. It was uh, just like this, and with a lot of decorations, and it was bones of uh, holy, uh, holy someone. Yeah, sure. And my mother used to say it's uh, chicken bones. <laughs> and <laughs> she inherited this from her mother and her grandmother. You know. And scholars claim that, that some uh, written material from the Bible uh, confirms that Jesus would have been born in June, okay, and that it was it was changed to December because uh, converting and recruiting Nordic pagans, primarily in Germany, which was a big threat to to, to the church, uh, it was a big agreement that we would move Jesus' birthday to December, and and that we would. The Christmas tree was the Tannenbaum of the of the Germanic tribes. 
Mm -hmm. It's true. And, uh, Miss and how did they know all that? And it wasn't until Queen Victoria and Prince Philip that it came to the English world. So okay. what you're saying is... How did they know all that? Because it sounds weird yeah. to know how, what time he would be born in June what? and what time it was shifted to December. They went yeah. there when the Holy Spirit was, was descending on Mary. Well, um, that's a good question, Benedict. I cannot recall the details of what these um, scholars allege uh, to, to uh, assert that um, certain indications in the passages in the Bible is what it was, uh, uh, saying that um, for this to have gone on, we know that in fact the taxes were collected, something like Rome ordered taxes to be collected in the month of June. And therefore, Mary and Joseph going to pay the, the, their taxes following the orders of, uh, of the Roman Empire and the, the Hebrew king would have been in June. Mm. And that, that that was a big concession made to the northern, the, the, the Germanic tribes in Europe. There we go. There we go. Anyway, whew, now that we've gotten ourselves... <laughs> <laughs> excommunicated from various denominations. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can go go on now and, and ask if we can, uh, would you all like to read in the second round? We, can we ask for two poems? Yeah. Yeah, why not? So uh, why don't we start, where, where did we start last time? You know, I have no memory. We started with uh, we start with Pina. Pina. That's why. We start with Pina, and then we followed with Isabel. So, in uh, Isabel, you would be next up, please. So I have just a little uh, haiku that I wrote uh, listening to you. It takes a last a lifetime to recognize your way on. Then once it's done, it's done, you die. And the other one is, it's a curse by a nurse. No use to yours, to yours, to yours, yours, yours. That's How would you spell that last word, Isabel? No use to what? Spell it? Uh, urge. Oh, okay. So would you read that haiku again, please? It takes a lifetime to recognize your way on. Then once it's done, you die. Um, yeah, As if you believe that our lives are a work in progress, you're, you're exactly <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Black humor. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So um, now can we move on to, I think that following him was that, uh, was it David next? David, Bill, Benedict, Jack. I think Bill was next. All right, let's have Bill go next. Let's have someone go next. Okay. Uh, a virtual rhyme. This is an old one. Every day begins and ends the same. The morning wake and wonder, say I love you. Every night make love as I loom in braille above you. Lost in the taste and the feel of the song of the game. Dirty and sexy like children we feel and we feel touching and touching the flesh of the prize we have won. As the long bright future gleams, beams like a sun. Can the pleasure be real, I ask? You say that it's real. By Saint Germain l'Auxerrois, a man plays bells in a rigged up cage and performs holding their weight and platforms holding their weight, painted with the price for doing this or that. Wire fencing wraps it like a cell. Clownishly, he clinks his music, smiles like hard fate, or its rider and master the orange lozenged acrobat. Well, that, that's, that'll certainly keep you excommunicated as well, Bill. <laughs> locked in it, ringing his bells and locked in a cage. All right. My dream and yours on a full moon's night. Another old one. My mind had just been captured on the tape. 
I thought there was a devil there, as though I'd been betrayed by one who loved me low. My body's dead, I said. We did escape. I'd given you a gift of bad cologne. Your aunt and uncle swore I'd known its state. You told me that you wouldn't hear their hate. I said, it's true, you're funny when you groan. I lay there savoring my dream, its joke, a film star phrase. And was the other there? I heard you moan or come, begin to cry. I thought we'd dream together and I spoke, but yours was pain and mine was not to share. Distortion was the white moon's prying eye. Speaking of dreams, All right, that was good. Yeah. To do, do, here's an odd, silly question. Can people share the same dream? Has that been dug up yet? Is that impossible? Is that possible? In fiction, certainly. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, in all this, this abundance now of neurobiological and all this research. Just curious. Sure, yeah, see, uh, Inception. Yeah, that's a good movie. Mm. For Hollywood, yeah, that'd be wild. Because um, <clears throat> what they're there, what they, the proverbial they, that's again the science community, is saying that they're going, they're on the verge now. They've done preliminary uh, success in sharing mind thoughts, un, uh, unspoken thoughts between two people registering. So they're in the, obviously, the primitive stages of that, that they're, they're claiming um, based on their, their, their experiments where everybody's wired in and all. You, that, uh, well, you, you may have had the experience of being with somebody, you know what they're thinking and they know what you're thinking. See, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. It's, it's, part of, it's part of being humanity. It doesn't have to be re reduced to, to, to machines and wires. And G five and whatever the whatever other horrors mm -hmm. they're coming up with to make everything simple and mathematical. Well, that sounds sentimental. <laughs> yeah. I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah, I just wish we could return to uh, where I could or we could could actually a dream could be a working vision. I mean, it can be with love. I think. And it can be with fear. It those polar opposites, you know. You know, you, one can wake up the next day and go, "I truly love what I dreamt that I truly loved." I truly fear what I dreamt. I truly fear. And then there's this all this ground in the middle. You know, it's a, Constantine claimed he dreamt that he defeated his enemies by uh, in a dream. He saw the rising of the cross. So it's a pain. In hoc signo vinces. So, so he led his army the next day, which was the underdog. They won the battle, and he declared the Eastern uh, Roman Empire Christian as a result of that. Yeah, and you know, the Native Americans talk about it all the time. They had a dream, and they followed it. Anyway, the, okay. So, Bill, did you read too? Yes, I did. Okay. So then let's go to you, David. All right. Okay. All right. Here's one. A couple poems here. Where did I see that one? Pages of it. Here we are. This one's called All Healing is Self Healing. You must pay attention. When I see a person, they are not whole. I only see a cross section. Like a thief in the night, he snuck around, laying hands on people and praying for them, and they were getting well. You're out in the woods, eating well, meditating, doing what you do. Hilarious emptiness inability to know social capabilities traps you in constructs of your own mind what do you say to that open to the now not while engaged in webs 
of thoughts and other crap. Split down the middle, there must be some way to reconcile. Holistic means to be made whole once again after being rent asunder out here. Either somebody's lying or there's something wrong with our language. All healing is self-healing. Okay. Amen on that. <laughs> and uh, here's a second one for the season. Yuletide cheer. In the early gray morning light, the tail end of a year, reading a batch of poems from 10 years before, then my mind was on sex or lack of it. Now my mind is on money or lack of it. The snow and water laden clouds of this big Yuletide storm swirl around outside the windows of my Knob Hill apartment, heading northwest, southeast, a fresh hot cup of espresso from some ultra impressive taken for granted newfangled machine on my kitchen table wakes me up. An early morning smoke smooths me out. When I read those poems I wrote back then, I think of my circumstances back then and see them reflected in the work. The same is true of now, but the common thread is poetry. Translating events like a verbal camera of unmechanical ultra subjectivity. The emotional moments of an individual recorded through time. Good poetry is accessible to others. Others who have lived, do live on planet Earth and beyond. Back at my apartment, the gray light has turned to blue white. I hear streetcars rumbling up Clay Street, people moving around in the house. A loud plane goes by over the city, breaks my concentration. Back to consciousness, I strive to live the poet's life about 0.23% of the time when I think about it. The rest of the time, I'm pretty confused, trying to find my true life's path through an ongoing series of compromises with all and everyone around me. But to stand in a hillside windowed room in the morning with a hot cup of thunderous caffeination in my grip and watch the cold Yuletide cheer outside rattle the windows, then I feel very keenly aware, secure in myself, ready to challenge the odds ready to speak my mind poems, to utter my poems of emotional realities, risk boiling the blood of some who may read them. Let nothing hinder the task of raising fun spirits as much as I can and encouraging goodwill and good cheer among every child, woman, and man. Wow, deck the halls, that's all right. <laughs> Little, wow, great. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you. Now, uh, Benedicta, are you there? Yes, I am. Would you like to render two pieces for us, Benedicta? I'm ready. Okay. So they are, both of them are monopus. And the first one is Clutches with Delves of a Scarred Past. Again, please. Clutches with Delves of a Scarred Past. Okay, now, Clutches with, what's the next word, please? Delves. What are they? When you delve into something. Oh, okay, all right. Of a scarred past. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, and a second one for us, please. And the second one is buttered and maimed in an embrace of opulence. 
Okay. Buttered and what? Maimed. Okay. Okay, so read Maimed, that again. Maimed, that's the word. Yes. So would you read that again, please? So battered and maimed in an embrace of opulence. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, I want to ask you, because you recite so many of these Monocos, uh, Benedicta, um, mm -hmm. tell me, do they come to you quickly or do, do, do you feel through them for a long time, you know, before you arrive at, at, at that Monoco? So it's basically on what I read. Okay. I'm able to read the same books and the vocabulary that I get out of it. That is what I use in formulating my one-liners. Okay. Do they, do they come to you quick? You know, the reason why I'm asking is because I have to struggle at times to, uh, lots of times, struggle to uh, finish a poem satisfactorily to myself. Uh, they might go two stanzas, three, four stanzas long, more. And and uh, so because I don't write as briefly as you do, I'm just wondering, does it, does it come upon you really quickly or do, does it settle in your mind for a while? No, it does. Whatever comes into my mind, I jot it down okay. so that I don't forget about it. Yeah, and, and perhaps... In something in, mag in a magazine or I might see some words somewhere then I'll, it will start going into my mind that I could formulate something out of it. Okay. And so then, a... then I have to jot it down somewhere mm -hmm. or just type it in one of my notes. Okay. And that way if you write it down right away uh, rationalization does not corrupt the feeling or the sentiment yes, you know exactly. what i'm saying i've had a really good hot a hot um, uh, expression come through me in words and then if i wait too long i go back to it and i begin corrupting the value of it by unnecessary oh. language and i go oh damn i had it so right the first time why didn't i just stay with that <laughs> I said, oh, I'll remember and write it down later. <laughs> ah, famous last words. You can't even share a screen. How are you going to do this? That's very, very, very true. It is. <laughs> very, very true. Good. All right. So now we'll move on to uh, Jack again. Hello, Jack. You're up. Hello. I'm still here. Yes. <clears throat> so let's see. Uh, I thought I would read this, which is called Verge. I fall from here to there, continually as though stones both paved and prevented my way, visible but where I could not see them. Essential form takes such shape, not by accident, but intent unknown. What time would reveal were instant, once at once, to coincide with absence that speaks instead where others cannot hear. Right. Their insensate intelligence will not lament, only to rod like traffic crossing a street, no light stops. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That's good. Uh, do you like that? I liked it. Yeah, I did. Okay. So do I. So do I. Because we Thank like you. you know, uh, uh, Bill is the judge, and 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 uh, to start on uh, what's going on, and we often ask Benedicta for her approval uh, later on when we read a poem, 
I think it's none of this is official or hierarchical, mind you. It's just uh, affectionate and sometimes humorous. Yes. Yeah, that's what it is. Either way, camaraderie. Better but, than me. So it's good. It's good. Have the woman who wrote the Monoko uh, give her opinion on any one of us who've written a hundred words. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> And then debating politics in the news, let's call on the judge. He'll set us straight. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Yay. Yay, yeah. Okay, so Jack's going to read another one. So here, yeah, here's another one. <clears throat> this is called, this is taking us back to Brooklyn, back to New York. Okay. Called Williamsburg Spleen. Okay. Flocculent descant, fragment revenant, through its mood, come down in declarative state. Although pageanted mentality, joy to white turns all light pejorative. This sky, this eve, this someday night blackened backdrop for the span abridged. One side fathomless fell, the other indistinct if low, how high? Well, all right. And it turns all light pejorative. Now that's yeah. a twist on that. All right. Yeah, that was during a snowstorm. Okay. All right. Jack always has this flair of how he reads out. Mm hmm And it's, it's quite touching. Keep it up. Mm hmm there we go. You you following that advice, Jack? I didn't get it, no. And she said, Jack has this way of reading. Go ahead, Benedicta. I said you have this kind of flair of how you read out your poems, and it's quite touching. Keep it up. Ah, oh, thank you. Here, here. Here, here. All right, all right. Uh, if, I, if I lose passion, I'm through. Yeah, yeah, yeah really. Uh, uh, that's what I like about um, the people who've come on to Angora. Uh, I have, I may be wrong, but I have yet to hear anyone read from formula, from MFA program formula, you know, from, from meter and line count, you know, with almost like monotone, not much inflection in the voice, more, more impressed on the structure and so forth. Uh, but there's a place for that. I mean, I just prefer the fact that we, we have our different voices and, and, and express our convictions and our passion for the way we sound. I like that. No, uh, when, when I started when I started writing again, what thirty five years ago, uh, I wrote lots and lots of sonnets. Uh, that's how I taught myself to write poems again. Cool. Okay. Well, I think I'm up next, and uh, because we've been talking about mysteries and. Uh, from uh, religious and biblical times. I will read you a poem that I've read before um, that then uh, has mysteries in it. And um, uh, this is a poem I wrote uh, when I was on assignment in Israel, Palestine, and um, uh, to break the, uh, uh, to, to break all the recurring bad news, I wrote this called Who Does Intifada? A woman in Gaza beats her clothes upon a rock. Arthritic hands curl and crack with the porous sands. She shares water at the well of Bedouins, its bittersweet wash to the tongue, lemon muscle to the mouth. Her leather lips spread atop gap teeth. She sucks air and echoes, traveling many winds in many days, camels journey from deep south 
of Khartoum. She will join falling dates and apricots before the wane of the crescent moon. Her fate sits in still waters. Destiny comes sure like the encroaching desert snake. The silence summons, she will fall, like the parted date before the wane of the crescent moon. I am old in the Arabian night, she tells the desert snake, watched as rocks reduced to a thousand sands, blown to the plains of Jordan, scattered to the Lebanon, sheathed to the Syrian heights, dusted to the waste of Rafa, caked mud in the hovels of Jerusalem. Lifting her crooked self erect, raising her arms, palms up, closing her dry eyes tightly, she whispers to the snake in the wind, O oh, Palestine, gather yourselves on donkeys, carry me home before I fall to this occidental mirage. So, wow, that's deep. Right she was point. deep. Nice yeah. one, Mo, that's a nice one. Yeah, it's deep. Yeah. Right. I love it very much. Thank you. Very, very deep, it's awesome. I can, tell, I can tell you a brief story. Um, uh, um, I was, uh, in that same year, I returned from uh, my second or third on site uh, a reportage over there, and uh, 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 there was this real a hipster in the old case, a real bohemian beat who had left New York and moved back to Pittsburgh, and he invited uh, various poets to read in an art gallery, and we all had to write a handwritten poem which was put on string in the windows, so there were these strings hanging in the front window with poems on them. And they might have coffee, bubblegum, wine, Leonard. Uh, it was it was Leonard. Le um, I remember that. And so uh, I went there. Uh, I was invited, and I was very proud to be invited because he was a well-respected uh, Bohemian beat, and had come back from New York and all that bit. So I went there, and so uh, a, a group of us uh, were lined up to read. And um, <clears throat> uh, as it turned out. Uh, two or three people in a row wrote about anti-Semitism, very much deeply felt <clears throat> about the pains and the agonies of the Jews in the Holocaust. And Leonard, being Jewish himself, bowed his head in respect to that. And then it was my turn to come up. And I took the little mic in front of this crowd and said, I too wish to speak about anti-Semitism. That is to say, the prejudice and bigotry against the Semitic people, the Palestinians. And a, and a woman in a fur coat and jewelry walked up to me and spit in my face. Oh. And so <clears throat> I wiped it off and began to read again. <clears throat> and some people hissed, and one person went out slamming the door. And in credit to Leonard, he went, shh, let him read, let him read. So, because uh, I was to read two or three poems. And the second one was called When Ibrahim Fell, which was about an assassination. And uh, by that time, there were grumbles in the room. So I finished, and uh, Leonard had the uh, courtesy and the dignity to say, thank you, Mo. And uh, it was clear, uh, by the way, the, the, the majority of people there, it was very crowded, and they turned their heads and looked away when I was done, and the place became very quiet. So I uh, pulled my shoulders back, took my papers, and walked slowly out of the gallery. And I got outside, and this guy came out after me, and he said, Mo Seeger? I said, yeah. He said, my name is Sam Hazel, and I'm a Palestinian American, and my brother is, is the president of the Arab American Association of the United States. And I just want to tell you, you're the first poet we've ever heard that's not one of the ethnics and uh, uh, Palestinian who's ever read in defense of our dignity and our identity. And that's how it ended. <clears throat> so that's how it ended. Yeah, so. That's great.
Yeah. And as I say, Leonard, who was Jewish, um, um, you know, held the fort and uh, backed me up when they hissed and when I got spit on and all that bit, uh, and calmed people down when they started making uh, little cat calls, you know, in the gallery. So credit. It wasn't a very polite audience, was it? Well, you know. Um, to spit on you, it was so silly, you know, so stupid. Yeah, that's, that's not so mean. <laughs> the thing is, she was about four foot ten. I'll never forget <laughs> her. She had that crazy hair that was, you know, when it goes purple, they dye it so much. <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> she looked like a little fur ball, like a, a Pillsbury Doughboy had a grandma. It would have been her, you know, sweet little grandma. <laughs> she was wearing a fur coat. Uh, uh, and, and I remember, I remember that because we were inside. And she kept her fur coat on and her little self, you know. <laughs> she stood out. And I guess it happened. And it happened like that because, as it turned out, um, um, the gallery was in vogue, and it was. It, it, as it turned out, it, it happened to be owned by a Jewish guy, and then the 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 programmer for that night was a Jewish guy. So by virtue of mm. that, it attracted a lot of Jewish people just on ethnic identity. Oh, you know, if Marvin's open the gallery, you know, and Leonard's going to do an event, so they had no fucking idea that a lot of other people were coming in, you know, as, <laughs> as, as just simply cosmic poets of whatever ethnic background they happen to be. So that's why that was, uh, it happened unexpectedly like that. So. So there you go. It was funny. And I would remain friends with this guy, Sam Hazo and Bob Hazo. Uh, they were Christian Palestinians and uh, leaders in the, the Palestinian community at that time in the early 90s was about as welcome as the plague. No one knew there were Christians, uh, mostly from the West Bank and and. and Things like that, and uh, so they were. They were. I mean, I invited a, a woman from the the Palestinian mission of the United Nations. All it was called was a mission to speak at the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, the whole auditorium was lined with uh, uh, government agents with their radios on. Um, and her message was was tolerance and cooperation and. Uh, she didn't give a, a uh, insurrectionist message. She just wanted people to recognize their place. And the, the auditorium was filled with so many suits with radios on. And in the 90s, they weren't so easily concealed. You know what I mean? It's silent. You hear these noises going off. And well, I don't know what they thought we were going to do, bring in the PLO that night, <laughs> something like that. And so uh, that's how that happened. So, you know. But I would tell them, the, the grandchildren of a Holocaust cannot cite that tragedy to justify the subjugation of another people. Oh. Yeah, so. And then it was so bad during those times. They really yep. suffered a lot. I'm sorry, who? The Holocaust. Yeah, people You're suffered. talking about the Holocaust. Yeah, I'm talking about the Holocaust and I'm talking about the occupation both. You see, it was very bad. Yeah, well, because uh, it, yes, it's it's just inhumane. It goes beyond ethnicity yeah. or religion or ideology. It's just so inhumane. You know, who, who would have thought? They, who would have thought? Who would have thought? I mean, I tell you, when I did some research, uh, it, it was an Israeli, uh, an Israeli Jew, Israel Shahak, survivor of uh, the Belsen concentration camp. He was a very, very elderly man living in Jerusalem and was a historian. Uh, um, and he was untouchable. He could not get persecuted because he was a Holocaust survivor. What that meant was with this handful of Israeli dissidents against the occupation, they would get beat up or threatened. If you were a Holocaust survivor, and most of, the whom, most of whom were not politically active at all, they were just glad to be quietly alive, okay? They were old and very quiet. They tended gardens. They only flipped out when they would see a Volkswagen or a Mercedes Benz, which were popular in Israel. And then they would scream and try to attack the vehicle. Okay? Even though Israeli society had accepted the Volkswagen 
and the Mercedes Benz as, you know, good vehicles. That was interesting. They would flip the fuck out when they would see a German uh, automobile. Other than that, they just wanted to guard little plots and be left alone, okay? Uh, but but Shahak was different, and uh, he had access to all these documents that were drawn up during the Second World War and with the settlement of Israel, because he had access to them at the uh, the archives in Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And uh, I said to Israel uh, one time, well, one time, I said to him that time, um, uh, what do you think of this uh, you know, they're, they're calling the Israeli response, the campaign against the Intifada, the Iron Fist. Doesn't that kind of ring a bell, Israel? He said, you know, I know what you're getting at. It sounds Nazi, doesn't it? And I said, yeah, it does. And he said, don't you understand? He says, it's the Nazis who taught us how to control people and keep them in fear as they did so well against us. And it was a lesson we learned that we could use to control the Palestinians today. And we both had this perverse laugh. Wow. Because yeah. he would tell me they studied German tactics and American tactics of putting Indians on the reservations. And the, the, the Israelis. He said so. Um, he said so. Don't be surprised we call it Operation Iron Fist. You know, the Germans taught us how to efficiently round people up and do with, with them what we wanted with minimal resistance and total fear. And uh, wow, <laughs> there's some real, some real ironies, some real ironies when you go around. <laughs> he was a good man. Uh, they, he was supposed to speak before Congress and uh, and then some people in Congress in, uh, barred him from speaking, uh, refused him after he was given a date to give a special address. But uh, he was a cool guy, Israel Shahak, you know, had quite a sense of humor. He uh, spoke Hebrew, of course, and when he, we walked through the streets, he demanded that all Arabs, who knew him, by the way, who knew him, he was quite well known for being a dissident, he demanded that they speak to him in Hebrew in Hebrew, even though he knew Arabic. And so I asked him, I said, why do you demand that all these people speak to you in Hebrew? He said, because uh, they should respect the history of my people while I struggle to help the, the, the suffering of their own. So, whew, that was Israel Shahak. <laughs> So it's Hanukkah. Hey, we've even uh, <laughs> even made some reference to that too. All right. So, well, I I think I said more than a mouthful. Anybody else wish to say anything about anything, frankly? I just want to thank everybody for being here and reading. Dream on, David. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'll keep dreaming. <laughs> And I'm glad you could stay later tonight, Bill. Are you off work yeah. tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the course I had Mondays and Tuesdays is ended and won't start up for another few weeks. Cool. Yeah. And then Isabel getting getting published in the the Rainbow Blog and your second uh, language. That's a double. That's that's a double congratulations. The orange. Congrats. Orange. And here we have, yes. and Benedicta was able to get home tonight and no disturbance in your signal with your monocles. Thank you so much, Benedicta. Huh? Mm -hmm. Always welcome. You're always welcome as well. All right. So uh, I'm going to sign off and, uh, uh, and I just want to say what I say. Uh, everybody, thank everybody. Thank you, everybody. Yay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Everybody. More nightmares. More nightmares. <laughs> more nightmares. More nightmares. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Sweet dreams, everybody. <laughs> See you all next time. Have a good nightmare. Bye for now. It's been nice. Bye. Ciao. Ciao now, everybody.
Bye. Ciao, ciao. Ah, here we go. Sign to leave. Here we go.